So when we hear trauma, we often think of, I don't know, car accidents or massive abuse, or we think of a war situation. But actually, trauma can be much more subtle than that, and it's still traumatizing. Many of us in the early years of our lives went through overwhelming situations. So a trauma is an o overwhelming situation, but it's not the situation that we go through, it's what that situation triggers in us. So trauma is not the external event, it's the internal process that's happening when we are going through a very overwhelming situation. And what's happening when we are going through a very overwhelming situation is two things. One is that we are super stressed and we, we all might know moments when we come into high levels of stress, also in uh, intimate relationship arguments, where we become very defensive, where we either want to run away or we want to fight. And when that exceeds, when that stress level in a traumatizing situation exceeds that level, so we become frozen, which means that the real pain in us, the deepest pain, is actually mute. And so one part of us is super stressed and another part in us, like there's kind of a fragmentation and we numb the part of us that is so overwhelmed in order to survive better. And that's different for a child at, at age one or a, a child that experiences bullying at school or somebody that has a car accident as a grown up. Of course, the intensity is different but the process inside is very similar. And what, what I want to point out at the beginning, that when we talk about trauma, we are talking that internal process, we are talking about something very intelligent that life learned over thousands and thousands of years. We developed an internal process as humanity. All our ancestors going through overwhelming situations developed in a way a process that is alive in us that protects us. So the trauma response is actually a very intelligent process, but if we don't take care of it properly afterwards, it creates a lot of symptoms. And we see those symptoms every time we become highly reactive or defensive or shut down, then we get triggered by our partners and then often our partners become the projection surface of stuff that happened way, way earlier in our life. And I know, Terry, you're going to continue from here. So that's, that's a basic definition of trauma. That's, it's, it's very simplified now for the purpose of our conversation today. But maybe, Terry, you can take it from here and uh, yeah, see how that relates to your love. Yeah, work. that's great. I, I just want to say two things. When we think about trauma, often we think about catastrophic life and limb kind of trauma, which is real. But as a therapist, I also think about what I call relational trauma. Uh, the kind of, uh, for example, misattunement between parent and child or anger uh, in, in the household that repeats over and over and over again. It's not threatening life and limb, but it does tremendous damage, relational trauma. And I also think about the difference between active trauma, which is something that shouldn't be there, anger, control, sexuality, and passive trauma, which is more of an absence. You can be overwhelmed by a parent screaming at you. You can also be overwhelmed with loneliness when a parent isn't with you. So uh, both of those things are traumatic. When we think about trauma, for the most part, we think about the wound. Uh, I call it the wounded child part of us, which is very young when you work with it. And usually about the first moments of life to four or five years old. And that part of us, which is very back in the relational brain, the emotional brain, the limbic system and amygdala, that, that part of us is just reacting to what we've had. That's the overwhelm. The, the wound in us is always overwhelmed. Between the wound and the wise adult part of us, the prefrontal cortex, the part of us that's here and now and thoughtful and deliberate, is that adaptation, that intelligent 
adaptation that you were talking about. And in relationships, what we often see is that the wound in us gets stimulated, but as you say, it's often cut off. We don't feel the wound consciously or we can feel it for about 10 seconds. And then the adaptive child part of us comes in to take over. So what we see in relationships is rarely, you know, somebody says something and then you just fall apart. What we see in relationships is somebody says something and then you fight or you flee or you fix or you freeze, but you move into your characteristic adaptation that you repeat over and over and over again. It's fueled by the wound, but you don't see the wound, you see the adaptation to the wound. First of all, attachment trauma is way more subtle. So even people that at first might say, no, I, I'm not traumatized, that I would have a second look at least because like we, we might not have a major event in our life that we can classify as a biographical trauma, but attachment trauma, as you said, Terry, neglect or chronic fight situations in the family systems between the parents, that is a different level of trauma, but it, it still creates a lot of uh, pain inside. And, um, and the attachment process is very fragile, it's very subtle, it's very beautiful, but it needs a lot of sensitivity and openness and relation. And so let's talk a little bit about what is relating. Because we often talk about relation as if it's a thing. There is a relation or there is a marriage. It's like a thing, it's set. But actually, now when I look at Terry, when I look at you, if I... Me. So then when I look at Terry, uh, I see a beautiful friend, but the Terry and the friend that I see is happening in my brain. Now, if the Terry out there and the Terry in my brain are the same, that I don't know. First of all, I don't know. I need to leave space that I see Terry only to a certain extent, given my own past, where I am traumatized, I can't see and feel him. And here we, we are with the next point. Like, there is seeing, I see Terry. My perception is already in my central nervous system. So the, the language of relation is resonance. And resonance needs feeling and sensing. So when I see Terry and feel Terry, it's like... When you, you know, all the new streaming technologies, like you watch a movie, either you download your movie and you have it on your hard disk, and then you watch the movie that you already stored on your computer, let's say. Or the more modern version, most probably, is that you stream it on a streaming platform. Like now, the fact that you can listen to us fluidly and it's, it's not getting stuck every 10 seconds, hopefully for you right now. So that means that the data is streaming well. Relation or relating is data streaming. And so I can update Terry in me moment to moment through data streaming, which means through feeling him. If I feel him, I have a moment-to-moment -moment update, like a camera that makes many photos, so it becomes a movie. If I, if I get triggered by Terry and I withdraw, I don't feel him anymore. And then Terry in Thomas gets old. I'm looking at an image in myself, not anymore the resonant updated version of Terry. And that's what we often see, because trauma in many ways is being inflicted through inappropriate relations, through relations that were already hurt before. And if, let's say our parents were traumatized, we are growing up in a traumatized uh, family system. And of course, a part of that gets transferred to us. So trauma hurt is being inflicted through inappropriate relation, and it creates a hurt in the process of relating. Because relating means I feel you, feeling me. I feel you and how you feel me. That's the music of relation. It's a ding dong, ding dong. That's, and when we hit trauma, it's like, so that is very important because often we think of relation as a thing, as something. But actually what really is relating is a data stream online between me and my partner, between 
me and my kids and between me and colleagues at work, I feel you feeling me is the basic attachment music. And that's called neuroception. And neuroception is the basic uh, sense our body feels if another person feels us. So if I feel you, your nervous system picks up on me feeling you. And that creates a deeper sense of safety. If I don't feel you, your nervous system picks up on that too without your conscious mind even being necessarily aware of it. And it creates already a bit of um, stress. And especially with our kids and also with us when we were kids, that sensing I feel you feeling me is the basic feeling of relational safety.